Hello, and welcome to Public Key, the podcast from Chainalysis. This is your host, Ian Andrews. When you're a content aggregator and you want to enable micropayments for creators located all around the world, what do you do? Build a brand new layer two blockchain, of course. Well, probably not most of us, but that's exactly what the team at NAMI has undertaken. In this episode, I have the pleasure of speaking with Jacobo Tolmasia, the CEO of NAMI, to understand what makes their platform so useful and what's new in the just released 3.0 version of the technology. Interestingly, some of the first customers for the NAMI platform are central banks looking to launch CBDCs. The platform's particularly well suited to governments and financial institutions who want to implement permission blockchain technology. For more on these topics and all things crypto, start planning your trip to New York for the Chainalysis Links Conference, which is happening April 4th and 5th. And get your ticket today because prices will go up soon. I've extended the early bird purchase window just until the end of January. You can find registration details in the show notes. I often get questions about what's going on with central bank digital currencies. Are they real? Are they actually happening? Who's at the forefront of leading this? And to be honest with you, I don't know a lot about it. So I went out there and I found us a guest who's actually involved in some of these projects happening in the real world. I'm joined today by Jacobo Tol Masia, CEO of NAMI. Jacobo, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to have you here. I thought we would start with your company, when I looked at your LinkedIn profile the first time we met, 15 years. The founding of NAMI starts before the Genesis block on the Bitcoin network was mined. So I think like a lot of people that join us on the show, particularly founders, you came to crypto in an indirect way. Talk to us about where NAMI originally started and how that led you into this world of micropayments and ultimately that got you to cryptocurrency. Absolutely. Thank you, Ian, for having me, by the way. It's a real pleasure to be here. We started a company a long, long time ago, a few years ago. What we did before we got into blockchain was content aggregation and distribution. We started first building a B2C, a location-based news aggregator. We didn't have a lot of success on the B2C front, but later on in the process and almost accidentally, we discovered our sweet spot was on B2B integrations. So we crawled, analyzed content from 200 countries, six, 7,000 publications in 50 plus languages. And we did some kind of funky stuff with the content. At that time, large companies like Alcatel, Panasonic, Telefonica, ByteDance, for example, the owners of TikTok today, they were building valuated services for their work complementing their main products. And those valuated services often were new news aggregators. So we were licensing our technology to them. They were getting the content from us. And that helps us to build this platform that was serving over 50 million users a day. Not a small audience. 50 million users a day is uh, is a serious platform. For people that don't remember or maybe got in into the world of tech more recently, j- just a quick thumbnail sketch on content aggregator. What was that? Because I, I don't think people use those types of platforms today, right? But it was a big deal for the late 2000s, early 10s, right? It was a really big deal. So I suppose that the biggest platform today might be in the States could be still Flipboard. Yeah. Flipboard became very popular very quickly because when Steve Jobs showed the iPad for the very first time, he had a bunch of pre-installed apps and one of those was the Flipboard. But basically, content aggregator is, is, uh, or news aggregator is a tool that saves you time from navigating the internet yourself and then uh, learn about what you like reading and then sources that data and then through a series of different algorithms will surface the right data for you. So it will save you time and will keep up feeding you the content that you are very interested in, which is it's a very similar technology to what, for example, Instagram might be doing or TikTok or even Twitter. And it came about in the time where most of the content on the internet was still written content, right? So Correct. I guess the biggest comparable today might be like the Apple News app, which is pulling together feeds from basically every professional publication. But I think you had a spin on it where you really wanted to pull creators. And this was probably even before people were talking about this this idea of Web 2 or Web 2 is in the very early days. And actually, people could get paid directly for their content, kind of ran right into this, this micro payments challenge that was huge. And this was in the days before Stripe. So being able to collect money and then just distribute money in relatively small amounts was basically a foreign concept. Am I remembering the timeline correctly? Uh, Yes, absolutely you are. 
So we reached the point where we realized that we knew a lot about the industry from, of course, our angle. And we wanted to find ways to leverage that knowledge. Now, we also realized that the content creators were the ones suffering the most. So it's when we thought about what if we could find this technology that could actually help us to leverage that knowledge and build something whereby we provide a platform to those content creators, right? So they can get paid on their work. That is when we started looking at this technology called blockchain. That was 2016. Although I am a software engineer by education, I don't, I didn't know much about blockchain. Yes, I had heard about Bitcoin. Yes, I had looked at it from the distance. I was unfortunately too busy uh, running a startup. So I never got you, to You weren't mining TV. Bitcoins back in 2011, 2012, <laughs> when you could still do it on your laptop. But then I was introduced to a gentleman who was working uh, with one of our partners, Telenor who actually discovered Bitcoin in 2011 and had been working around blockchain for a long time. So he helped us to to give shape those hypotheses that we had formulated in terms of what if we would find that technology. And he basically confirmed that, yes, we could build a micropayment solution, peer-to-peer -peer market where we could reward those creators. So after many months of back and forth, then we decided to go one step further and getting into blockchain. It's kind of an amazing journey. And I think a lot of people criticize the world of crypto because they fail to see real world applications of it. But you actually started with a real world application, which is I've got creators all around the world and I'm aggregating eyeballs on the internet. And now I need to distribute payments out to these people. And I can't deal with local currency conversions. And I can't deal with the cost of transacting payments into everyone's bank account. Maybe some of these people don't even have bank accounts. And so crypto is such an obvious solution for that. You've got a global network. You can relatively low cost, relatively pain free, distribute crypto all around the world. Simple solution. So it worked great, right? You now have this huge content platform and all these creators who you're paying in Bitcoin. Well, that was the that was the hypothesis, right? And, <laughs> and the beauty about running a startup is that sometimes you get in a bubble and then you formulate those hypotheses and everything makes sense, right? It's like, oh yeah, yeah. we should yeah. do this, this, and that because it's much better than the real world, right? We just forget that the real world has gone through a thousand battles and um, they don't talk hypotheses, they talk facts. But it did make sense for many points of view. And then once we started getting into it and, and we opened up the hood of, of the engine that runs the Ethereum blockchain, and we realized we had a slightly different problem, which was scaling, which made us, again, get into the next stage of our journey. And this is where I'm fascinated. We've had a couple people who are working on building new chains on the show. We had the team from Odyssey who's building a chain that's really focused on wallet tech and cross-chain ownership of digital assets, which I think is an important problem to solve. But I was fascinated that their conclusion and technical approach was, well, we need to create a new chain in order to fix some of the challenges with wallet UX and cross-chain asset holding, because it just seems like such a Herculean undertaking. I think a lot of people have looked at Ethereum since it launched way back in 2015 and said, hey, there, there's scaling challenges here. There's some other architectural challenges that certainly drove projects like Solana to launch, where they came out from the beginning, basically with a feature roadmap that was kind of like, here are all the problems with Ethereum. We've solved them all. But I think we've seen over and over again, like it's not quite that simple. Like the technical issues in Ethereum exist because the problems are real and hard. But I'm curious, like at what point did you look at Ethereum and go, we might be able to build something that is better here? If Was it focused on a particular outcome rather than a general purpose chain? Is that how you got to the point of saying, let's build our own chain? That's a good question. So first of all, there's a lot to unpack on what you just said. So first of all, we did look at Ethereum because we felt that Ethereum was the right, the right network during then. And and we did plenty of due diligence in terms. So we needed smart contract capabilities. We needed a high degree of decentralization and security. Uh, at that time, Ethereum went from, I think it was like $5 in November 2016 to uh, a year and a half later, it was like $1,400, $1,500. So it suffered a phenomenal growth. That growth, unfortunately, also brought in and attracted a lot of dubious players that I was told, because I wasn't part of the industry before, I was told that the industry had always had dubious players, but maybe the ratio of good players versus dubious players was was more, it had a bigger equilibrium. But of course, once we started building uh, or designing and building the content marketplace, the centralized content marketplace, we knew already that that a scaling was going to be a problem. So we actually reached out and met with the guys at OmniSego, who at that time 
we're building Plasma scaling protocol. And we were lucky enough that one of our guys, Mark, our COO, had been working with them, had been reviewing the technical white paper. And they told us, listen, you, you're able to use our SDK. It should be ready by November 2017. We started working with them and we were hoping to get early access in the year. But by the 31st of December 2017, we kind of got tired of waiting and we saw nothing was coming. So start January 1st, 2018, we, we started building NAMI. We had to pivot within a pivot, right? And that is why very often we say that on NAMI, we have built multiple startups in 15 years, which is effectively true. But we could, of course, have chosen the path of some other actors in the industry, which is, oh, this network doesn't work, therefore we're going to build our new L1. That topic alone could take many hours discussion. I'm a former engineer or a cycle engineer. I haven't been writing code for, for, for many years, but I'm lucky enough to have built systems for 25, 27 years now. And I don't think that escaping technology and moving on to a brand new flash technology or project is the way to go. They're very seldom. It, it is very attractive because it gets people motivated, right? Again, it's about the hypothesis we were talking about before versus the cold hard facts, right? But we felt that the right thing was to build a layer two on top of Ethereum, which is what we have built. And maybe time will prove us right or wrong. So far, time is proving us right. <laughs> but we're still very early in the process. So it might be that in five years' time, we think otherwise, that building on top of, of Ethereum was the right choice. I think that network works like Solana will, will always exist. I think it's going to be healthy to have a wider ecosystem of layer ones, equally having a wider ecosystem of layer twos, because now many years later, we see that every layer two is designed for a different purpose. I think that's a great point. We actually had somebody from the team at Celestia on the podcast last season, and they brought this concept of composability into blockchain and kind of instead of it being one monolithic protocol that supports a wide variety of applications, the argument was made, look, scaling is going to be tackled by having certain components be application specific. So you may leverage, as I think your solution at NAMI does, the validator layer of Ethereum and kind of the network security that's inherent by the distributed nature of what's been built there. But then you have other elements for consensus or transaction creation, block aggregation that are purpose built to the task at hand. And therefore you, you get some scaling advantages, which made a lot of sense to me. I don't think we're quite there in terms of market adoption where people are thinking, oh, I, I need to own some of these components myself. Like Cosmos seems to be driving that for a couple projects. But I I'm curious, like, let's get into a little bit of the technical detail. When you arrived at this decision of, okay, we're going to build a layer two scaling solution atop Ethereum, what were some of the early design goals or problems that you saw that you wanted to solve and that kind of led you down a, the path of the first implementation of NAMI? What did that look like? So because where we came from, having a business whereby we were serving 50 million users a day from large companies, and also because of the background that some of us had in terms of the industry who had been working in building systems, we understood that the need for mass adoption had to had to check some boxes, right? And the most important was the finality of transactions. So I, I've personally been working in investment banking for a few years in London. It is well known that a few milliseconds of latency can cost a bank up to $100 million. That is why some banks will have fiber connected from banks to banks just to be able to, to reuse that latency. The other one, of course, was which is super important for users, is the predictability in the fees. It is important not only from a consumer point of view, but also from the total, total cost of ownership of the solution. So if you go to your CTO and say, hey, both are like $5 million to build this product. He will probably ask you some hard questions that you will need to answer in terms of how much it's going to cost us to run the system, right? You say, well, I don't know, between this much and that much, and that is a 100x, then I don't think you're going to get much from it. Depends on how much other people are using the system. It's variable. Like, that's a hard thing to budget Correct. for. It is hard, right? And for example, these two items alone, we were the only ones that brought them back uh, or brought this conversation back in, 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 in 2018. And again, we don't have huge crypto Twitter presence or we don't spend much time with, with that part of the industry. But what we have seen now is that there is a trend that has been going on for a couple of years now that they're trying to catch up on that. So unfortunately, you will have false statements about the finality of some of the other layer twos right now. They claim that they have some finality, which is, again, mathematically proven, so it's not about it. Opinions. Or you have other initiatives around EIP standards just to hope to bring down the costs of the transactions, but yet they will still make them viable, right? Which defeats the purpose. But those two items were key for us. Instant finality, no latency, and, and predictable fees. That was uh, paramount. 
two super important goals, right? I mean, I see a lot of people talking about this. Catch us up to the present. So, you know, you started this journey back in 2018. You know, now in 2023, five years on, I think the tech is real. People are using it. I could potentially go leverage the NAMI solution and start building with it? Yes, you can. Also, we are probably the only team who has built several versions of the protocol for, of a layer two. The first one, I mean, I have to be brutally honest with you, we were too early to market. I, I don't think that the world was ready, I, irrespective of what was happening on the price action, right? And the entire world talking about the price of ETH and, and Bitcoin, having that excitement in retail or on the news or on the app store of whatever platform, it doesn't really mean adoption. It means that people is interested in the price and on the, on the gambling side of the industry. But the first version of NAMI only supported payments, which is, of course, it, it wasn't enough. But it's also true that we over-engineered the damn thing. So now layer twos talk about, you know, escape hatches. So what happens if the operator goes down? You still take your money out. So we did implement those kind of features. Now, fast forward a couple of years, and then we started building NAMI 2, which was EVM compatible and supported smart contracts. We deployed it at the very top of the bull market <laughs> a couple of years ago in 2021. We kind of rushed it. We rushed some aspects of it. So NAMI 2, is, is it good enough? Yes. Is it good enough for what we want to do? No. The answer is no. But it has worked very well for us because it has taught us many lessons. And we have been able to build about eight, nine different products that we have not yet launched to market. And through that experience, we have understood what are the limitations of NAMI 2. That takes us to NAMI 3, which we already have got a, a testnet and um, has solved the problems of NAMI 2. Plus, of course, it brings some of the features that makes the product pretty unique. Most likely, as we're publishing this episode, NAMI 3 is going to be launching to the world, maybe on mainnet. We'll see how the exact timing works works out. But for anyone listening, like, what is in NAMI 3? What have you learned from version one, version two, that informed the development cycle that led to V3? So what NAMI 3 will bring, so the key aspects is, of course, to ease the life of developers. So that is its adoption. So we will have EVM equivalents. So if you would like to port whatever products exist on Ethereum mainnet, you would like to port them to NAMI, you can easily do that without any, any problems. Also, we will support all the opcodes. We will not have the same limitations around contract sizes. But most importantly, we are working on a modularized architecture that should allow you or, or should allow us to accommodate the needs of customers or partners that might have different requirements. What we have experienced, for example, by spending the last five years speaking with large and medium-sized companies that would like to get into Web3 is that all of them, depending on the industry, of course, but all of them have got different requirements. And those requirements couldn't be met, for example, on, on Ethereum mainnet directly or even the other layer twos, right? So one of the unique properties of NAMI, and we did that very carefully when we designed it, is that it is non-censorship resistant. Just to be clear, we're non it's a non-custodial solution. Uh, we cannot seize your money. But what we wanted to do from the very beginning was to allow those third parties building on top of NAMI to have full control over the environment. So if you're a large financial institution and you would like to apply KYC AML and at all the level of business rules, you should be allowed to do that. Because ultimately, building software is about giving control to the party building and running the software. And and I understand that kind of creates a bit of a, a clash with the peer-to-peer -peer and, and, and trustlessness or censorship resistant uh, approach towards, towards blockchains. But equally, as we were talking before about layer ones, that there's going to be probably many successful layer ones. There is also going to be different successful architectural solutions for companies to build on top of a blockchain. I think that the end goal for all of us that loves blockchain is, is clear. What we would like to get will be a trustless and permissionless environment. But going from centralized services today to a fully decentralized and permissionless world is, is a utopia that is not going to happen. So, And there are many steps in between. And with the architecture and the product we have built, we are looking for building those guys. This is something that's obviously very close to our domain here at Chainalysis, where we're balancing this. I'm very pro-privacy, but I also recognize that there's limitations to that, right? That can't be the ultimate feature because that just creates an environment that sort of lets bad actors get away with things that I'm not comfortable with, right? I always think about it as a spectrum rather than is it private or 
public or is it controlled or completely decentralized permissionless those aren't just two stops on the wheel there's degrees of freedom between the two so i'm i guess i'm not an absolutist or a maximalist i think what you touched on there i want to drill into a little bit more is this idea of KYC, so know your customer, anti-money laundering, kind of risk management built into the network layer. I haven't encountered anybody else who's talking about the approach that you've taken here. Like, how does that work in practice? What is the technical layer? Is Does it mean that like a bank might implement their own NAMI layer two validators? And so then they can control who can access portion of the network? Like, describe what this looks like. That's a very good question. Imagine for a minute that you could have your own node on Ethereum and you could build a wall garden within it. So you would still have all the benefits of playing in the Ethereum ecosystem. You could leverage the tooling, you could leverage the knowledge of third parties, you could leverage those products, but you could encapsulate it in a wall garden by which you can decide who can be part of that wall garden or not. So if you are that financial institution and you're regulated and you have some specific uh, requirements to meet, then you want to make sure that you can actually fulfill those. Right? So that is something that you will be able to do in Lime 3. And now the implementation details, we are not to tell, for example, the financial institution how they should be uh, enabling the KYC because they may have their own procedures and, and, and that is not part of our business. But what we can offer them is the ability to decide that if Bob, who is KYC, would like to send $100,000 to Alice and Alice is not KYC, they have the ability to not let that transaction happen. Mostly because, again, they would be breaking the law and they could get the head of the patch. And so there's there's some mechanism by which you're sort of admission control into the network effectively, where you're, you're able to say, right. look, these people have been vetted in likely some offline process. Somebody got a picture of a driver's license or a passport, maybe some source of funds checks, things like you would have to go through to open a bank account today or for most crypto exchanges these days, same process as banks. And so they they have that verification. Does that get stored on chain? Like, is there a token issued or is it a different process of connecting like a wallet to a real world identity? Excellent question. So we have not implemented that ourselves for these partners as indicated, but different different architectures have been discussed. Some of them are very pro on chain, which is something that we think is fantastic because again, going back to what I've mentioned before about this is where we are today, this is where we would like to be, and we'd like to fulfill the steps in the middle. We think that that is definitely the way to go. And and what we see is that those partners are actually they have a more open mind with regards to all the other things that are coming with the blockchain. Right? You owning your own identity and just giving them access to it and then allowing you to play in a world garden, right? Well, some of the guys will want just to integrate with legacy systems, which mm -hmm. again are centralized databases containing KYC ML data. Now, what we have seen though, which is very interesting, is that since the FTX debacle, people certainly would like to move away from centralized exchanges. And they see the power of having non-custodial solutions that are well-architected, that is still are fully compliant with the requirements that they need to meet. So I'm not saying that they will be moving that way. What we are seeing, though, is a clear intent. And unlike, for example, four years ago, in the last bear market, what we see is that people are not going back into the caves, so they're not retreating from, from working on the Web3, but instead they're wondering, what if? What if we would actually make use properly of this technology, right? And we could build those non-custodial solutions. And I think that non-custodial sentiment has, is pretty widespread. Like I, I've seen a lot of people posit, well, yes, FTX was likely a fraud and centralized exchanges generally are hard to trust because we don't have transparency of what happens in all of their off-chain operations. Like we see money go in and we see money come out, but beyond that, it, it's a black box. And DeFi has done great. So we look at DeFi where everything is happening on chain and it's completely transparent, complex, but still transparent. So there is there is a seemingly higher level of trust because of that transparency. And I think it's fair to say we haven't seen a collapse of any of the large DeFi protocols through the last year worth of contagion. So I think I agree with the point you're making, which is there's appetite for non-custodial financial services solutions for sure. I noticed on the website, you talk about something called Skunk DAO. There's a handful of projects that have spun out of Skunk DAO that start to look a lot like DeFi solutions. So, so lending, liquidity providing. Talk about what that is. What's the relationship to NAMI? What's the goal and the aim with Skunk DAO? 
we set up Skangdao, I believe, in January, February last year, mm -hmm. 2022. And the idea behind it was to have a mechanism to bootstrap our network with the key products that we think would add more value to users. And of course, to us, because we're running for profit company, which is important. But most importantly, or equally important, that will give us the right tools to build a showcase for those Web2 companies wanting to get into Web3. So, for example, when we were talking before about Nami 1, Nami 2, Nami 3, and, and I indicated that we saw that Nami 2 was not ideal, it was not perfect, we got to that conclusion by eating our own dog food. And historically, we have been pretty good at that. So, equally, when it comes down to onboarding those Web2 companies to Web3, we don't want to tell them, you know, this is the best thing since it's sliced bread, and, you know, you can do whatever. We're not very good at, at selling high-level stuff. We are pretty good, however, at building products and showing them and giving them something tangible to see, you know, this is how the damn thing works. Your engineers, not market. You're you're actually building yeah, products. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That is right. That is right. So yes, and and we are playing a lot with DeFi in Thailand, and we have built a bunch of things that we believe are very, 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 very important, not only to us, and and also keep in mind that we are one of the few teams in the industry that has got a protocol and now is building an ecosystem on top of it, right? But again, we have been able to repurpose some of those products and give some very serious demos to high caliber companies and institutions. And then again, it's a little easier for them, right? Because whoever has been building products for a while and goes and has got experience talking to large institutions or small institutions, it's a lot easier to talk over a product that works where they can actually click things and understand what you're talking about, right? Rather than just talking over PowerPoint and hoping the recipient is going to comprehend the message that you're trying to set. Very cool. So the things that have come out of Skunk Dow so far, proof of concept and build some of the foundational layers of decentralized finance atop the NAMI layer two. Is it open? Like if I'm a developer listening to the show, can I apply to get a grant from the DAO or support if Absolutely. I want to be building? Absolutely. Absolutely. So far, there are only two products live on NAMI two, but we have six or seven other products coming out on NAMI three. Okay. And um, we believe that these products are going to help us just to demonstrate to users why NAMI is so good to use and yeah. it's so fast, so instant and so forth, right? We just could write many white papers about it, but ultimately it just comes down to playing with that tool. Got to write the code. So at the top of the episode, I teased this topic of central bank issued digital currencies, CBDCs. And you're one of the first people I've met who's actually working on real CBDC projects. So I, I wanted everyone to have the background on what your journey building NAMI, because I think the technology is what enables you to go actually start working working on this, this CBDC project, some of the things that we talked about with transaction finality, predictability of fees, scaling, those all sound like attributes that if I was the Federal Reserve uh, or a central bank in a major country, I, I would care a lot about those. So I can imagine how the technical married up, but maybe for the audience, let's start with like, why would does anyone want a CBDC at this point? When you get involved in one of these projects, like what's the demand and interest? Is it because of the hype cycle or is there real world use case that a government's trying to solve when they get involved with your team? That's a good question, which again, maybe we could take many, many hours to answer. <laughs> what I know though, I mean, and I will of course speak from my own point of view, I cannot speak on behalf of any central bank that Absolutely. we might be working with. Yeah, yeah. And of course I can draw some conclusions again from the discussions that we have had with them, the experience we have with them, and also the products that we might be building. But what I know, though, is that it is not for controlled society, right? which is the biggest fear that most individuals in crypto Twitter have. So let me go back to 2021. So 2021, we spent a fair amount of time in talks with different financial institutions. And even further back in 2018, when we met for the first time, a central bank, we were talking to them. The reason why we have been lucky enough to get to work with institutions of that caliber, first of all, is because the fact that we had one or N products built kind of helped, mostly because we could speak from experience. Second, we are older than the average Web3 team, you know, in average inside the company as well. So we speak as well their language. It's kind of very important to have a high degree of empathy. Keep in mind that even if you are a bank of a nation, it doesn't really mean that you know anything about Web3 or crypto. They certainly know a lot about what they do, but they need to find the right partner to work with, to feel that they are in that comfort zone. Right? Now, now, so those are certainly some reasons why when we go to work with central banks, that we have built stuff, that we have a pedigree in history, and certainly we help them to make feel comfortable. Now, the reason why these guys want to build central bank digital currencies, I don't think it's about the hype. I think that they have understood that the same way as 20 odd years ago, 30 odd years ago, the internet revolutionized how we communicate. The blockchain is going to be the same at uh, 
financial level. And you were mentioning before about DeFi, how well it has come out of this debacle of three ACs and Celsius and, and FTX and so forth. I think that DeFi, you know, which started as an experiment five years ago, has uh, matured immensely and has done a beautiful, beautiful job. And I can tell you the central banks are absolutely looking at DeFi. They are intrigued. They have a bit of itchiness about using it. They really want to get, get on with it. But also they comprehend that they have domestic problems and each country has got different domestic problems. And they would like as well to enable a CBDC to solve some of the problems, right? And maybe some of those problems might be, you know, we have one or two players that have got full monopoly of, of the financial markets in the country and would like to change that. Or some of the issues that we'd like to solve is, you know, we have a large percentage of the country that it is unbanked and we would like to easily bank them, right? So far, we have come across only very noble and unique situations and, and problems that they would like to fix and gets us even more motivated to keep on working with them. That's really exciting. I have to admit, before joining Chainalysis, I wasn't deeply familiar with the problem of individuals who are unbanked. I sort of thought about it as a faraway problem that didn't exist in the country I live in. And, and then I actually started reading some stats on this. And I think in the United States, there's you know over 5 million people who are unbanked, which seems incredibly high as a percentage. And what I've gathered as I've started learning more about this is that problem is, is happening in, in lots and lots of markets. We had on one of the founders of crypto exchange based in Australia. And, you know, Australia, basically, they've got four big banks. They own the entire market. Everybody banks with one of them if you're going to have a bank account, maybe a couple. So this idea of being able to adjust that consolidation, reset the market, give people more direct access to currency, and, and modernize from paper to digital make, makes all the sense in the world. So one of the questions I often get is, you know, will a CBDC be retail-facing? Does it have the potential then to replace credit cards or debit cards. Well, I just have a crypto wallet, the central bank issues, you know, I'm able to get money directly from them, the digital assets are directly issued. And we kind of the entire current generation of payments layer gets upended when a CBDC gets introduced. Any takes on that? I love the question. And I absolutely would love and certainly I invite everybody who is going to listen to the podcast just to get their turn of thought in that direction, right? Instead yeah. of, oh, our CBDCs. Is similar to see my country going to be introduced just to control what I can do with my money, which is not the case. So as soon as you go down that rabbit hole of what is going to happen if the CBDC is implemented, then you realize that the opportunity size is literally in the trillions of dollars. So we have been exposed to both the desire of a retail and a, and a wholesale CBDC. We think, of course, that the, the fun part is on the, especially on the retail. <laughs> uh, mostly because it can tilt the balance in terms of how mm -hmm. things are currently implemented. So the level of, of disruption at industry level, it, it is it is much, much bigger. Basically, all existing financial software will have to, if not rewritten, will certainly have to be integrated with the CBDC solution. And we know that once that happens, and we have plenty of examples in other industries, new companies appear out of nothing. And going back to the paranoia of CBDCs being done to build, just to control the population, and again, I'm speaking from my own experience. When we speak with central banks that want to enable a retail CBDC, they are very encouraged by the possibility of disrupting the existing players and finding ways that are faster, cheaper, better for consumers, right? And don't get me wrong, in some places, like for example, where, where I live in Norway, we don't really touch paper money. I believe uh, this by 2025 or something like that, that, they want to get rid of paper money. So everything is digital. I love that. Funny story I just read, and there was news in the US this week where someone in, in Washington state, a, a legislator proposed a law that would prohibit businesses from not accepting cash. So the exact opposite of what you're, what you're subscribing to there. He wants to push us all back to carrying around paper money, which just made me laugh out loud, but keep going. So, so in Norway, <laughs> yeah, but all paper money likely gone by 2025. I mean, that's not far away, right? We're talking two years from now. I believe it's 2025, which of course has made the public institutions to become more modern, uh, more agile. So you can actually do a lot of paperwork without having to go to any to any public buildings. You can do everything from home. And uh, so we have a little bit of, a, of an idea of how that it could look like. Now, if you bring a new currency that it is being issued by a central bank in a fully transparent way, and then you give opportunity to any or to new companies to build new services to make things better, faster, cheaper for everybody, then it becomes very powerful. 
I know that you're in early stages of a few of these CBDC projects. Can you tip your hand at all, like timeline when someone might see one of these come to life? Like when can I go get in my MetaMask wallet, you know, a central bank issued digital asset? How far off is that into the future? So which fits a little bit back to the question that you asked before about, yeah. is, is this just a fashion, is it just a trend? What we see is that about 90, 95% of the global banks, uh, central banks are actually pushing for a CBDC strategy. And you have some actors that have already deployed the solutions. Some of them are relatively successful. Some of them are very unsuccessful. But I believe that in, in three years, we will see some large nations actually moving money through CBDCs. And, and then again, this is going to disrupt. I know before I was talking about small businesses, small commerce, but you have a $6 trillion a day FX market, which is also going to be disrupted, which is overly expensive, slow, and tedious, right? Like you as a consumer, me as a consumer, as a traveler, why do you have to pay exorbitant fees to third parties every time you want to go and use your debit card elsewhere and so forth? And, yeah. and of course, the, that will also have a domino effect, right? So keep in mind that while you might have large central banks exploring and working in, in isolation, the vast majority of them are talking to each other. They're putting out public tenders. They're starting to suffer a little bit of FOMO because there is also this competitiveness, right? Like yeah. who's going to go first, right? Yeah. Who's going to yeah, have yeah. that key advantage? And so they have moved away from having the analysis space and hiring five guys in the bank to study, should we, should we not, and if so, how it should look like. Now they are actually hands-on building stuff. That's exciting. I'm, I'm eagerly anticipating it. One of the things that I've wondered about, I'm curious your opinion, is do we end up with hundreds of currencies when we move into this digital world? Or does there actually become some sort of consolidation, globalization? I mean, even today in the financial system, like most international trade transactions, I think are denominated in dollars. And there's many countries around the world that use the the dollar as their reserve currency because it's just more stable than, than a locally produced currency. But it's far from universal, right? The other major currencies like the euro, pound, yen, obviously the yuan in China. For countries that aren't using one of those top five currencies, do you see ultimately we all kind of consolidate on one like magic digital internet money and that just becomes the currency of choice? Or does that cause issues for monetary policy and central banks in such a way that that's unlikely to happen? Why don't we go back down memory lane and, and, and yeah. think about when the internet came out and we started having more and more and more newspapers, right? Where do you get your news from? Do you get your news from and different places, places that five years ago you wouldn't think you would get them. Equally, I think that opening onto the internet on a blockchain, how, how currencies are created is only going to give us the possibility to really enable projects like the fail Libra from Facebook. And I think that the future is very bright in that sense. And I think that we will see experiments that socially will absolutely succeed and, you know, will give us some opportunities that we don't have otherwise today. Because still, the monetary policy of many countries is, is very tight. And again, by to the last five years of discussions we have had on and off with different institutions, we see that they are getting ready to disrupt, not themselves, but to create that relatively controlled disruption that will enable new areas of growth for themselves and for their nations. So I think that it will be moving towards a more dynamic, less strict monetary policy when it comes down to currencies. I think that's going to be good for everyone. I'm, I've always been pro-globalization. And, and I think the currency controls have been one of the big challenges to, to effectuating that in a way that it actually benefits populations of countries around the world. Other way to look at it is, look what has happened with Bitcoin. I mean, Bitcoin 10 years ago, who the hell would have guessed that Bitcoin would be where it is today? So imagine if you have better, faster, cheaper technology that is accessible to literally everybody on a mobile phone. And you have a small companies building some really funky stuff, right? To do DeFi solutions that we don't even think about because we can even think about today with, with multiple fiat back tokens or CBDCs created by, by central governments. I, I think that that is a recipe for very interesting solutions. Well, I think we wrap there. That's an amazing outlook for the future. Yakobo, thank you for joining. Excited to learn about NAMI and see the 3.0 launch happening here soon. Appreciate you joining me on the podcast today. Thank you again for having me. It was a pleasure. Hey there. Thanks for listening to another episode of Public Key. Follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and our newly launched TikTok and revamped YouTube pages, where we share our favorite moments captured in this podcast and other great content from the Chainalysis team. And if you have a minute, drop me a tweet at Ian Andrews DC and tell me what you'd like to see next. 
Last week, American law enforcement, in collaboration with other international agencies, were able to arrest Russian national Anatoly Legkomandov for his role as founder of Bizlato, a crypto exchange operating primarily in Russia. Furthermore, U.S. Treasury's financial crimes network, FinCEN, identified Bizlato as a primary money laundering concern for facilitating illicit actors' attempt to facilitate ransomware activity. For more details on the arrest, and to read more about Bizlato and similar exchanges operating out of Moscow City, check out the Chainalysis blog linked in the show notes.